برنامه نانگل و سرخ رو نگاه میکنید مجله اجتماع سیاسی که به زبان انگلیسی و فارسی روی کانال جدید پخش میشه سلام به همگی عزیزان من مرمه نمازی هم امیدوارم حالتون خوب باشه در برنامه این هفته مصاحبه جالبی دارم با سرا هیدر از سازمان اکس مسلم آمریکای شمالی در رابطه با پدیده فضاهای ام در دانشگاه آمریکا انگلیس و غیره در زم در رابطه با آشورا و حسین پارتی حکم اعدام یک زن جوان به اسم زینب لکران و شلاق زدن بچه ها به خاطر اینکه مادر پدرشون نمیتونستن ورودی مدرسه رو بدن صحبت خواهم کرد فتوای احمقانه این هفته در رابط با حسینیه در بازی فوتبال ایران و کره شمالی است و لحظه زیبای زندگی در رابطه با فیلم جدید دیاخان در مورد بی خدایان اسلام خواهد بود امیدوارم از این برنامه خوشتون بیاد با ما باشید میدونیم که این هفته و ماهی که گذشت محرم آشوراس و خب کلی بعد همه حسین 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 بکنن و خب کلی خودزنی هست خون سرازی میشه در مراسمایی که جمهوری اسلامی دوست دارن سازمان بدن چه تو خود ایران چه خارج کشور و خب میدونیم که هر چقدر خون بیشتر باشه اینا بیشتر خوششون میاد هر چقدر انسان حرمت انسان بهش احترام گذاشته بشه اینا بعدشون میاد هر چقدر خون و خوشونت سرازیر بشه اینا طرف دارشن و خب یه سری مولاها ها گفتن که این میدونیم اینو خودزنی های خورده آبروی اسلام داره میبره و یه چهره عقب مونده ازش نشون میده خب نه بابا راست میگین معلومه یه چهره عقب مونده نشون میده به خاطر اینکه عقب مونده هست و واقعا ضد انسانی این مراسم ها به خصوص وقتی نگاه میکنیم که حتی کودکان هم در این مراسم ها شرکت میکنن و میبینیم پدراشون مثلا دارن کمک میکنن که خونالودشون کنن و این واقعا یه خوشونت علیه کودکان یک نقص پایه حق کودکانه و غیر قابل قبوله چه به اسم مذهب باشه چه به اسم فرهنگ باشه چه به هر اسمی باشه و خب میبینیم که ایران سرزمین نقص حقوق کودکانه اخیرا یک داستانی شنیدم در رابطه با وضعیت یک زن جوونی به اسم زینب لکران ایشون حکم اعدام گرفتن از سال 17 سالگی و این خب شامل حکم اعدام کودکان میشه زیر 18 سالگی و ایشون به خاطر کشته شدن شوهرشون حکم اعدام گرفتن و چیزی که الان مشخص شده اینه که ایشون مورد شکنجه قرار گرفتن که اعتراف کردن که شوهرشون رو کشتن شوهرشون کلن یه کسی بود که خیلی میزد زینب و مورد خوشنط خانوادی قرار داده بودتش و زینب به خاطر اینکه حامله بوده ادامش به سرانجام نرسیده هنوز و اخیرا به خاطر اینکه یکی از همسلولاش ادام شدن بچهش را از دست داد و الان به نظر میاد که میخوان ادامش کنن و چیزی که الان مشخص شده اینه که شکنجه شده حتی وکیل نداشته خب این چیزای خیلی معمولیه توی جمهوری اسلام ایران و یک دادگاه غیر عادلانه داشته که کلا دادگاه جمهوری اسلامی نمیتونن عادلانه باشن و خب میدونیم که خودش الان گفته که برادر شوهرش بود که چندین بار بهش تجاوز کرده بود و شوهرش رو کشته ولی خب مهم نیست برای جمهوری اسلامی چون اون ماشین اعدامش باید همینطور به حرکت بیفته و خب هم توی خود ایران هم خارج کشور خیلی دارن در دفاع از زینب به پا میخیزن و میگن که نباید اعدام بشه اعدام اولا که یک احکام ضد بشری ضد انسانیه و هیچ وقت نباید صورت بگیره به خصوص وقتی برای کودکان و به خصوص برای کسایی که مثل زینب هیچ جرمی رو محسوب نشدن به جز این که زن بودن در اون جامعه و بچه بودن دختر بچه بودن در اون جامعه و در آخر نمیدونم اگر بینندگان عزیز خبری رو شنیده باشن که در یک دهکده به نام مختاراباد در کرمان یه سری از بچه ها به خاطر اینکه مادر پدرشون نتونستن مهری پول 
ورودی مدرسه شنو بدن شلاق شدن شلاق شدن و بعد اخراج شدن از مدارس چون واقعا چه سرزمین ضد انسانی برای کودکان و خب خوشبختانه کسایی هستن در ایران که مبارزه دارن میکنن برای حق حقوق کودکان و در سطح جهان و انسانیت رو نمایندگی میکنن در مقابل جمهوری اسلامی که واقعا زدیت با کودک زدیت با انسان و واقعا یک به یک هنر تبدیل کرده است چند هفته پیش من در کنفرانس زنان و سکولاریسم در واشنگتن دی سی شرکت داشتم، سخنرانی داشتم اونجا و اونجا با سارا هایدر که از سازمان اکسموزیم آمریکای شمالی هستش باهاش صحبت کردم و تونستم باهاش مصاحبه کنم در رابطه با پدیده فضاهای ام در دانشگاه انگلیس و آمریکا و خب این پدیده جالبیه خیلی اوقات من برای مثال که میرم دانشگاه ها جلوی صحبت های منو میگیرن قدقن هم میکنن از رفتن در اون دانشگاه ها یا سعی میکنن جلسه منو به هم بزنن به خاطر که میگن که صحبت هایی که من میکنم علیه اسلام یا اسلام سیاسی انقدر کسایی که میشنون این صحبت ها را عذیت آزارشون میده که واقعا نمیتونن تحمل کنن شنیدن یه صحبتی که غیر قابل قبول از نظر اونا و کلا این اسلامی های دانشگاهان که سعی میکنن این کارو کنن و خب این پدیده باعث شده که خیلی از جلوی آزادی بیان کسایی که معترضن مخالف اسلام و اسلام سیاسی رو بگیره و خب این سراحه در الان داره در رابطه این پدیده صحبت میکنه با ما باشید حرفه خیلی جالبی میزنه جایی نرید سراحه در لفلی تا هفیه آن پروگرام I wanted to speak to you about the conference that just passed women and secularism and the discussion around safe spaces From your perspective, what's the problem with safe spaces at universities in particular? Well, I think um, where the idea begins, which is to say that you know some students, when they're uh, having experienced trauma or significant setbacks or oppression, um, they want a space on their own where they can feel relaxed and they don't have to feel um, embattled by you know various people I think that from uh, on on that just uh, basic perspective it seems acceptable and I think a, uh, people have a hard time saying no to such a thing it seems kind of ridiculous except in practice it is one of those things that leaks into campus life in general when students come to expect that there are times and especially uh, within classrooms where they can feel that they must be protected from certain ideas and especially that they must must be protected from ideas that are uh, troubling to their identities and unfortunately too many students think that uh, their politics are part of their identity and this makes it very difficult to talk about politics in general to talk about social issues that are so important um, in in our discourse and that it makes things uh, very difficult in college campuses and I know that there are people who you know the dissent from uh, the I guess the norm thinking in in college campuses and they have a hard time speaking up they have a hard time uh, saying their piece and just expressing intellectual disagreement because they might be hurting someone's feelings or identities and they, they don't want to be called a bigot, they don't want to be called hateful, so they are silenced. And this is a very unfortunate state of affairs. I don't think anybody thought that it would end up this way, that this is where we would be, but this is where we are. And we have to look back and see where, where did we go wrong and what can we do to change it. Well, isn't it nice not to hurt people's feelings? What's the problem with that? Why, why not do that? Well, it's absolutely, it's, it's, what is nice is not the same thing as what is good. And I think that sometimes uh, people on the left and liberals in general confuse those terms. You know, they think that what is nice and what is going to uh, make people happy is the same thing as doing uh, the right thing in any circumstance and doing a good thing. So when it comes to specifically people who are under, you know, religious delusions, people who feel that women are just, you know, uh, secondary citizens um, in terms of, the, you know, the law on earth because that is what their religion says, I mean, they, uh, that is what they feel and if you were to say that no men and women deserve equality under the law here on earth today you would be hurting their feelings and uh, there are cases where we have to say that it's okay to do that it's okay to not be nice to people who are not doing uh, things that are 
good for our society, that are going to be healthy for our society, that are going to promote the kind of ideals that we want to see in the world. What do you think of this idea where um, with the you know, safe spaces, they say, are meant to defend minority rights? So what happens to minorities within minorities? Well, that's, I, I think that's a very interesting question, and that's the, the main problem with this, with this dialogue and with this discussion is because it looks at minorities as just a group of people who all agree on, on everything, and that there is um, some sort of uh, uh, you know, single, singular um, idea that they can all agree on and a policy that they can all agree on. And that's very dangerous for people, people like us, people who are ex-Muslims, who are minorities within minorities. It makes it very hard for us to speak out uh, because uh, we feel that, okay, when you are um, somehow betraying your race, you're betraying your people, and it can become a very toxic thing. And it's, it, it is one of those things that seems like it's helping minorities and it's helping race relations, but I really think it's one of those things that is racist at its core and it's making race relations worse. You mentioned on the panel uh, an example of uh, rape law and how that's not being discussed in law classes because of these sort of safe, safe space policies. Tell us about that. Well, that was... Um, when I was researching for the panel in general, just to just to see about the impact of um, you know the discussions like safe space and microaggressions, what they've the, d the impact they've had on student life and on discussion in general, it was probably the saddest thing that that I saw because it was something where you can directly see how harmful this would be for women's rights where uh, some students are so sensitized to discussions of uh, of rape um, or of violent assaults. Um, um, to, towards women that uh, they can't even discuss it they can't even talk about it and especially when it comes to when it comes to rape law when a uh, professor such as the, the Harvard professor that I mentioned um, in the panel I think her name is Jeannie Sook she talked about how she specifically chose cases that were difficult uh, they were there were cases where it wasn't clear if the aggressor deserved punishment if he if, if the aggressor really was an aggressor if this really was rape and and students have to pick a side and think about it and discuss the issues um, in you know in a nuanced way and some students found this very difficult to do and uh, some professors uh, she she said in her article have have felt that they can no longer discuss rape law in class. It's just too sensitive a topic. Students are um, too easily, uh, too, too, they too easily feel that they are being, you know, uh, attacked in some way uh, or uncomfortable enough, un uncomfortable enough that they complain um, to, to the, you know, the various administrators in the universities. And so professors think, well, is it even worth discussing? And this is a such a clear way where we can see how this is harmful towards women. We need to study rape law. We need to talk about the complexities about rape law and what it, what rape is, what an aggressor is, um, what consent is, and just the, the various, the, the, the gray line that that is some, sometimes difficult to talk about, but we need to talk about this. Um, and this is, I think, such a clear way to see how um, these uh, discussions where people people say that I'm, it's too sensitive to talk about, I can't talk about this. Um, I'm, this is hurting me too much, how this clouds our judgment, it clouds our thinking, and it disrupts learning on campus. And it could be that practically everything upsets someone, and it will end up not being able to talk about anything, basically. Absolutely, and, and uh, who will that hurt, I think, in the end? Um, if, if we look about, if, if, if we look at our society um, as a place where, you know, how they say, white males have, have a lot of power. Well, um, if that's the case, then they're not going to be the ones who are significantly hurt by discourses like this. It's going to be uh, women and minorities who bear the brunt of it, and especially minorities within minorities who really can't talk about their issues at all, who are truly silent and have no institutional power to be able to talk about their experiences. And that's what's most devastating. And I think when we when we look at it as these safe spaces, these microaggressions are a way to protect minorities, I don't think they are. I think some minorities, and I say some because I know many who are not, some minorities may feel safer, but I don't think they are safer. And I think they're creating an atmosphere where we're, they are significantly more in danger because we do not have the intellectual structure to support the kinds of policies that we care about that will protect minorities, that will protect women, that will protect you know sexual minorities, religious minorities. 
you were saying that we need to go back and find another way. What do you think those are? Well, I think uh, what's, what's definitely clear is that these patronizing sort of rules on campus, we know that they don't help. We know that sometimes they make things worse and they create an atmosphere on campus where people feel like they can't talk about the issues that we really need to talk about, the issues that are very politicized, the issues where emotions really get in the way. Those are the issues that we really need to hash out. We know that this isn't helping. Um, and I can't say for sure that I have a solution, although my feeling is is that speech helps and empowering people and to make them especially minorities and women to make them feel like hey you can speak and if you are persuasive if you have facts you might not get through to somebody the first time but you'll do it again and again and again and it'll work and we know that it has worked because we've seen how much our society has progressed we've seen how much in in this this liberal assist intellectual system where we use words we use arguments uh, to fight to, to get our way we found that women's rights have gotten better women have a have, have it better in in America in the UK in the Western world in general than to do in in uh, the parts of the world where we can't speak at all so we know how useful it has been in the past and I'm worried that we're we're giving it up we're thinking that oh well uh, we're, we're not looking at the gains that we have made throughout the decades and, and centuries even by using this very important tool because we become impatient maybe with the progress. And um, so I think let's look back to see what's worked and respect what's worked and not be so quick to denounce it and not be so quick to throw it away because it, freedom of speech really has been what we can count on. Uh, what we can count on to be there for us, those that, that don't have institutional power, those that don't have uh, financial power, we don't have any real power, but we do have this. We can convince people with our ideas. A final question. You mentioned how dangerous it is for uh, offensive speech to be equated with violence. Can you talk about that? I think that's um, something that's very uh, clearly related in my mind with uh, the idea of blasphemy where there is such a sin, where there is such a speech that is so harmful, it is so uh, hurtful either to a god or maybe to uh, certain people, that it, it is in itself a form of violence. And when it is a form of violence, uh, I think you just inevitably justify the belief that some speech can be answered by physical violence, because it is violence in itself that legi that, it, that it is a legitimate response to uh, to answer offensive words to offensive verbal violence with physical violence and that's where we get to justifications like charlie hebdo unfortunately where people thought that there was something some things that they said that were so hurtful they were so out of bounds they were a sort of violence onto those people they didn't make that distinction between speech acts and physical acts they blurred that line and because they blurred that line we saw a lot of people that lost their lives and i think that this is something that we have to be very careful about when we when we talk about speech acts and physical acts we have to be very careful about these lines and make sure that the distinction is clear because our society depends on our ability to make those distinctions and be very clear about them. That's how our progress has happened. That minorities who were once very offensive to those in power, you know, people like you know, gays, um, uh, LGBT in general, but various minorities whose uh, appeals were offensive to those in power, but they were allowed to speak, but they were allowed to make their case. And in the end, we have a better society. So let's, um, I think we should be very clear about those distinctions, and liberals especially should make them. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for having me. امیدوارم از مصاحبه با سراح در خوشتون اومده باشه به نظرم مسائل مهمی اینجا مطرح میشه شاید برای بینندگانی که تو ایران هستن این بحثای خورده عجیب و غریب باشه یعنی در دانشگاه هایی در انگلیس در آمریکا در کانادا برای مثال یک پدیده به وجود اومده به اسم پدیده فضاهای ام و بس اینجاست که میگن که یه سری آدم های حرفای میزنن که انقدر آزار دهنده است که دانشجوان اذیت و آزار میشن اگر این حرفا رو بشنون و به همین دلیل این افراد نباید اصلا اجازه داشته باشن که وارد دانشگاه ها بشن و خب این یه چیزیه که به منم اتفاق افتاده چندین مورد که گفتن قدقن ورود من به 
یه دانشگاه هایی مثل دانشگاه وارک پارسال یا دانشگاه ترینیتی کالج در ایرلند و یا گفتن که اومدن من باعث میشه که فضای امن جامعه اسلامی دانشگاه اذیت بشه اسلامی های اون دانشگاه اذیت آزار بشن و خب بستر اینه که اولا که دانشگاه که نمیتونه محل امن باشه از صحبت از حرف بالاخره آدما میرن دانشگاه که ایده های جدیدی بشنون و امکان داره که خیلی از ایده های جدید که میشنون مغایرت داشته باشه با ایده هایی که خودشون داشتن خب امکان داره قبول کنن امکان داره قبول نکنن میتونن بحث کنن بس اینه که دانشگاه باید جایی باشه که هر نوع عقیده آزاد باشه برای بحث و تبادل نظر و به چالش کشیدن عقایدی که دانشیان دارن این که دانشگاه باید یه فضای امنی باشه از بعضی عقاید خیلی خطرناکه به خصوص چون وقتی میبینیم در عمل اینطوری میشه که کسایی که منتقد اسلام هن. منتقد اسلام سیاسی هن. کسایی مثل من ماها اجازه نداریم وارد دانشگاه ها بشیم ولی اسلامیانی که میان و هر روز طرفدار اعدام کافرین و مرتدین و غیره هستن اینا به راحتی میتونن بیان صحبت کنن و خب بحث اینه که فضای امن نباید در دانشگاه باشه و یک کاری که کسایی که مدافع حقوق بشرن و حقوق آزادی بیانن و آزادی ابراز عقیده هستن در صف مقدم هم که این فضاهای امن رو بشکنن و خب منم هر جایی که بهم گفتن نمیتونی وارد بشین من بالاخره وارد شدم و حرفمو زدم به قول سلمان رشدی اگر از یه کتابی خوشتون نمیاد بجین که برین بسوزونیش ببندینش نخونینش کسی زورتون نکرده مجبورتون نکرده و همچنین در دانشگاه اگر خوشتون نمیاد که من دارم میام صحبت میکنن یا یه کافر داره میاد صحبت میکنه خب نه این جلسه هیچی نمیشه برین برین پی کار زندگی خودتون بذارین آدمایی که میخوان این نظراتو بشنون بذار بتونن این این حقو داشته باشن و خب فضاهای امن واقعا مضرن مضرن برای آزادی بیان مضرن برای به خصوص کسایی که منتقدن و وضع موجود و قبول ندارن باید فضای مسابقه صد در صد آشورایی و کربلایی باشه باید در و دیوار اونجا سیاه پوش بشه تمام فضا سیاه پوش بشه فتوه احمقانه این هفته از ایران و امام جمعه تهران که گفته بودن که در بازی بین کره جنوبی و ایران باید یک این بازی به یه آشورایی تبدیل بشه حسینیه تبدیل بشه به خاطر اینکه در این ماه صورت گرفته و خب مشخصه که گفته بودن که کسایی که میرن به این بازی باید سیاه بپوشن و به جای اینکه دست بزنن برای تیم فوتبالشون باید یا حسین بگن حسین 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 و خب جالب اینجاست که یعنی واقعا مسخرگی قوانین و فتوهای اسلامی رو به وضوح می شدید مشخصه که کسایی که رفته بودن برای اون بازی برای حسین پارتی رفته بودن رفته بودن فوتبال رو نگاه کنن و خب وقتی که تیم فوتبال برد تیم فوتبال ایران برد زنده باد همه خیلی خوشحالی کردن و حسین بی حسین یادشون رفته بود لحظه زیبای زندگی این هفته از دیاخان یک فیلم سازی که چندین جایزه برده این دفعه یک فیلمی درست کرد اخیرا در رابطه با بی خدایان اسلام و خب این فیلم واقعا فیلم جالبیه فیلم تاریخیه و نشون میده که چقدر وضعیت کسایی که از اسلام روی برمیگردونن چه مشکلاتی دارن 
چه تو خود اروپا چه در کشورهایی مثل ایران و عربستان سعودی و بنگلادش و خب دلیلی که این فیلم الان تو لحظه زیبای زندگی روش صحبت میکنم به خاطر اینکه جدا از همه اذیت و آزارا و خشونت هایی که مورد اه، 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 که این افراد میبینن و جزو زندگیشونه این کسایی که دارن از اسلام روی برمیگردونن و جنبشی که به وجود آوردن واقعا جنبشی که ازش شجاعت و انسانیت و امید میباره و از این زاویه بسیار مهمه یه چالش مهمیه به جنبش اسلام سیاسی نه با خشونتی که اسلام سیاسی نشون میده بلکه با عشق و امید و شجاعت حتما اگر تونستین این فیلم رو ببینید ما سعی میکنیم در هفته های آینده این فیلم رو براتون ترجمه کنیم با زیرنویس زی فارسی که بتونین کل فیلم رو ببینین حتما سعی کنین این فیلم رو ببینین واقعا از این فیلم های تاریخی و بسیار جالبیه به هر حال رسیدیم به انتهای برنامه من امیدوارم از برنامه این هفته خوشتون اومده باشه و تا هفته آینده هفته خیلی خوبی 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 داشته باشین تا بعد خدافز We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.